Hey everybody, Joe slash Fizzle CC here, and today I'm going to be kicking off a brand new series in which we're going to go through Construct 3 project files and talk about what we like, what we don't like, and what we might do different from a variety of creators. Special thanks to my buddy Xanderwood, who's up first in this review with his submission of Survival Slash. So let's go ahead and jump on in. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up this project file. Survival Slash by Xanderwood. All right, so we've got title screen and we have game layout as our two layouts. So let's take a look at game layout. Nice and tidy. It's a nice use of the Lucifer tile set. Link down below in the descriptions. Uh, you can get that art off my itch page. And then if you go through here, we've got all of our object types and folders. Nice organization. Let's take a look at our event sheet. Ah, good, you're using groups. Everything looks nice and tidy. This is gonna be a breeze to review. All right, let's go ahead and give it a play and see what this is that Xanderwood made and then dissect the event sheet. All right, so we got some good grooves here. We can uh, change the music. It's pretty slick. Nice title screen, Xanderwood. Thank you for making this. Right, let's go ahead and get some play. All right, AWSD to move. Looks like I can walk around this tent. All right. Oh, okay. That's not gonna hurt. They run into me. And I grunt. <laughs> and I've got my health coming down. Oh, looks like there's some gold I can go and collect. All right. All right. It looks like they keep coming at me, and eventually I'm gonna be overwhelmed. Let's go ahead and let these guys take me down. Let's go into the camp. Thirty-four. This is actually the second time I played it. First time I scored much higher, 540. So nice use of the keeping the score in memories. All right, so let's start with the title screen. In the title events, we have this section called menu navigation. One of the things that I noticed is that Xanderwood had set up this looping mechanism for his music selected variable so that he could loop through the songs that he was gonna play. I'm gonna take this as an opportunity to show how you might have done that differently to make it more flexible. So let's go ahead and I'm actually going to add some subgroups here. All right, so what could we have done differently here? Um, you know, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make use of an array and that's gonna require us to use Ajax to call it, but it's gonna allow us to be a little bit more organized and we're gonna see how we can loop through that array to keep everything stored nice and tidy. One thing I'm noticing is that he is putting it in sounds rather than music. And it's probably not that big of a deal, but technically you want to put it in music. So sounds get loaded when they're needed. Music gets streamed and you can find that in the manual. Now I also then want to use my modulus and I'm going to reuse my array song.track.height. And what the modulus does is it returns the remainder. So this equation is saying, hey, let's just say I have five songs and my current music selected is, let's just say it was three, then I'm at eight and I wanna um, go from three down to two for music selected. So I've done five plus three is eight, minus one is two. And then I do the modulus of, you know, divided by five and the remainder is two. And that's how we're gonna do it. And it works going back the other way too, um, as you loop through it. So it's an easy trick that you can use to loop through arrays. The next thing we have to do is just play the song. So let's go ahead and copy this. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah, it does. All right guys, cool. That was how we implemented our loop. Nice job. I went ahead and I already went through each of those groups and I created my alternates. So let's go ahead and talk about what I did in each one. One of the things that I did notice that Xanderwood does in his code is he makes heavy use of the every so many seconds. And that's great, but I will say that there's something to be learned here, which is the use of the timer behavior. And they're largely very, very similar and interchangeable. But one thing that is a difference is that whenever you start over a layout, your time that you're using for every so many seconds is actually tied to your system time. If you had something that says, hey, in 10 seconds, I want something to spawn. Well, if you ended a game and reloaded the layout and it was only had four more seconds 
to turn on, then in that version of the game, it would spawn after only four seconds rather than resetting itself. So it's not a huge difference. And for what he was using it for, it largely isn't gonna impact the gameplay that much, but it's something to, to realize. So underneath the alternate, I did something very similar, except for I added a time manager object, which I added the timer behavior to. And you'll see in the rest of the code, there's I think five locations where I changed the every so many seconds to a timer and just used it there. So that, that way, no matter what, at the start of the layout, it starts at zero again and kicks off again. All right, let's go on to scoring. So you can see here in scoring, he made use of that every two seconds. So inside of my alternate, I just use on timer score. And I had already set that up up here for two seconds. And I went ahead and I hit add one to game score. Another thing that comes up in his code that I was going through is there's a lot of um, trigger once events, which sometimes gives us the feel good that like it's only going to trigger once. But in these triggers, it really should only happen in that situation. Okay, so timer, as you can imagine, is very simple. Um, instead of replacing using the every one seconds, I use the on timer and I'm adding one to the timer so that I can display that as text. You could skip this step and actually use the variables in the timer to create the text that you that you need using some, you know, integers of the, you know, duration and current time to come up with what your value is. But this is a nice, simple way to do it. And I didn't see a need to change it. Player controls. This is where I loved what Xander Wood did. So he came in here and because this is a top down uh, tile set and it's four directional, um, he came up with this variable called player direction that I thought was very clever um, to use. So I'm definitely going to use this all the time in my games. Player direction equals down. She set up his WS DNA movement and he has some conditions here of making sure that it's not attacking and making sure that it's not, you know, that the player is not dead. And then he simulates the eight direction movement scheme on the player. So he's using eight direction behavior on the player, which is great. Um, and then he's setting the state. Fantastic. He's using a state machine. If you come over here to the player, you'll see that he's got states and a couple of bullions of attacking and dead. Uh, all that is great stuff. And if you come in here, he's got, you know, your animations that are listed here. He is updating his player direction each time and that lets him then trigger this sequence. I'm gonna show the player animation at the same time. He's using this big sequence of, if the state is this, play this. Now, one of the things that Definitely, I want people to take away from though from this video that is a way simpler way of doing this that will keep your life way easier, especially as you get more and more sprites, is to make your animation name the same as your state. So walk up, idle up, walk down, walk right, all those things. Keep those the same, and then you can do a very simple trick. And Xander would largely have done this except for just a, a handful of them weren't the same. So I changed them already in here. And what that allows you to do is rather than having all those checks in the state, you can just have these two, which is set the animation to the player dot state, and then it's done. If you look at my controller alternate, I really didn't do much other than he had had all these extra conditions on each event. It's not doing anything wrong. I just like it a little bit more clean. So I brought it up to this event and then everything is nested underneath those two checks. Otherwise, very, very nice job. I love the use of the player direction variable. All right, now let's go on down to enemies. And this is where I had a little bit of fun. I decided I need to add a little bit of complexity because I love adding way too much complexity into my games. And I wanted the enemies to have more than a move to scheme. So if you come in here for Xanderwood's code, he has a basically move to the character, every tick. This is the AI for tracking you. Every tick, where's the character? move them to the player or the character. I wanted to actually make use of some intercept math, link up above for a previous tutorial I did it, to make it a little bit more smart. And I also wanted to add some visual aids in you being able to see where the enemy thinks that you're going to be. Let's come in and take a look at what I did. So on start of layout, I actually added a uh, to the enemy an intercept X, intercept Y, and intercept T instance variable. And this is where we're going to be computing what we believe the X and Y and the time, how many seconds until intercept that we're going to have between that enemy 
and the enemy pl sorry and the player using their speeds their direction and all those things using this additional timer that i said on intercept then i have i think right now every 0.25 seconds i'm going to loop through every enemy and i'm going to actually calculate what my intercept is using a script update my instance variable and then i'm actually going to set my move to my intercept x and my intercept y i don't end up using the t but i'm calculating it so i stored it maybe you could display how many seconds until impact whatever you want to do but let's just dissect this a little bit more so on intercept for each enemy if the player speed is zero i'm not going to bother doing it because the intercept is just go to the player <laughs> otherwise um, i do have to do a check where if the enemy isn't moving I want to use its max speed rather than its current speed, uh, just so that it doesn't have an error state and how you would calculate the intercept. If it's not moving, it can never intercept the player. Um, and then else, this is what you think, we're gonna call this intercept where we have to pass in the chaser's position X, Y, the runner's X and Y, which is the player, the chaser speed, the runner speed, the direction, and then we're also gonna pass in the chaser's UID because we have lots of enemies. And I'm gonna actually show you guys in the script how you can update a instance variable from JavaScript of a specific enemy. So passing in the UID is useful to doing this. Let's jump over to it. All right, I'm not gonna dissect this in detail. Like I said, there's another tutorial that I did on this um, exact same topic. The things that I did here, which was new, was I passed in the user ID. I actually set the enemy to that user ID using the runtime get instance by UID command and then what I do at the end is after I calculate it all I set the instance variable by using this dot inst vars dot and then you can put in whatever your um, instance variables name is so if you had health or whatever you could use that here too and then I use the resulting calculation of my position of in intercept x y and time so that's kind of fun so let's go ahead and give this a play and see what this is doing all right, we'll get the, the music going again. All right. Go ahead and enter. All right, so you can see here, this is them attempting to figure out where I'm going to be. And right now, I have it so that my speed is higher than theirs. So normally, it's going to end up just being uh, where the player was. That's what it returns. But you see how he tried to intercept me. So this is... Let's go ahead and knock out these guys. Let's get a few more enemies on the screen. Oh, I see that? Perfect example. He was going to go around the object and intercept me rather than try to uh, just follow me endlessly. So, right, we'll, we'll give this, let these guys build up and get lots of green lasers on the screen. Let's see how long I can run away. Uh -oh. Ah! <laughs> ah! Intercept math is fun and it makes your enemies way smarter. So use it in your AI for where they're going to be going rather than just blindly always following where you were. So that was my little addition to the game. Um, if you come on down here, gold and functions, I largely didn't do much. Gold, I replaced the every five second timer with my time manager. I actually like the use of the wait 10 seconds. It makes your code way more readable. Coming into the functions, one, there was one thing that I did do here uh, he was using this attack function to kind of also help with his states and it really wasn't needed for the attack. All I'm doing is setting the attack to this, be the direction that the player's facing and returning it. And then that other section of the code where it's setting the animation to your state is taking care of the rest. So Xanderwood, awesome job, man. Uh, really great game, nice organized code. I had a lot of fun going through it. Uh, hopefully people picked up a few tips and tricks. My key takeaways were think about using arrays, think about how you can make use of the timer behavior rather than doing the every so many seconds, especially on things that are dependent on when the layout starts. Think about how you can do your enemy movement, 
really, really try to make sure that in your state machines, you're making the animation names the same as your state. It'll make your life easier. Lastly, showing how to use inside of a JavaScript, the ability to update your instance variables on a specific object. You can do that by using that tip and uh, trick I showed you guys there inside of the code. So thank you everybody. And with that said, I do wanna say a big shout out and thank you to my patron supporters, James Welch, Clone13, McCall, Stevie Conlon, uh, Lee Ching Ming, thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Really appreciate your support. And anybody who does support me on Patreon does get unlimited access for all the art I do have on itch, royalty free to use in their games. Uh, what you saw today was actually the Lucifer set and there's a ton of stuff behind that. So go ahead and check it out on itch. And thank you again to Xander Wood for his participation and looking forward to doing more videos. I know that there's another handful of people who are also working on games right now for me to go through. Thank you everybody. Have a nice day.